This life we live is very extraordinary. Some of us will experience it much longer than others. And it's filled with many ups and downs. Many of us will go through much sorrow, much grief. And the soul, and as every man desires, is rest for it. And today, this is what we'll be talking about is rest. And today I want to make clear that as believers in Christ, Christ calls us to rest in him alone. Now, if you may turn your Bible with me to Matthew 11, we'll be looking at verses 28 to 30. It's a very unique passage because out of all the gospel accounts, this is only recorded in Matthew. Before reading this, I just want to put some context. Christ at this point in his ministry is in Galilee, and he's speaking to the crowds of people. And most importantly in these crowds are the Pharisees. And this is sort of a polemic against the Pharisees, against their teachings, about how they twisted the scriptures and how they created much burdens upon the people that created a greater weariness for the people. So it's good to know, and before reading this, that the Pharisees are in the crowds. So let us read our passage of scripture. Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Well, the first thing in verse 28 that we can see is that Christ is teaching us and Christ teaches us to accept his invitation of the gospel offer. This is a salvific passage and he's calling a certain group of people to accept his offer of salvation. But who are these individuals? We can take a closer look at this as if we turn to verse 25, three verses before, verse 28. And this is what it says. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding. And the things that are hidden is the gospel. And it's quite clear, Christ says, is that he is hidden these things, these things from the wise and understanding. The wise and intelligent here are people who are trusting in their own wisdom and disregards God's wisdom. These are the people who are filled with pride and boast in their own learning and knowledge. That's why we see in the, uh, this is a great polemic against the Pharisees and their teachings. It goes contrary against them. But we also keep in mind that the wise and intelligent here also include the religious man. The religious man in his pride will trust in his traditions and his own works to make his way to God, making him just as prideful as an unbeliever. There's no such thing. When God gives us intelligence, and God gives great such men with intelligence, Intelligence is not a bad thing, but it's when men use it in their pride and to use it for their own selfish ambitions is when it is sinful. That's why God says in Proverbs 16, 5, everyone that is proud in his heart is abomination to the Lord. And this passage of scripture shows that we should warn against uh, a warning against ourselves that we should not just know Christ intellectually is that we should know Christ wholeheartedly resulting in a, in a faith that produces works, in a faith that produces fruit. So let us test ourselves and to ask ourselves, are we producing fruit? Do we know Christ, not just intellectually, but wholeheartedly? Now we know Christ is who he's not inviting. He's not inviting those who trust in themselves, who think that they themselves earn their salvation. But once again, if we look back to verse 25, and after he says, wise and understanding, it says, you revealed them to little children. 
Now, looking at the phrase, little children, I'm sorry, when looking at the phrase, wise and intelligent, it refers to a proud spiritual attitude, not to mental ability. And the word little children does not refer to a physical age or capability, but to a spiritual attitude that is humble. But if we look at the figure of a baby, a baby is totally reliant on their parents for everything. And a baby is completely, utterly helpless without their parents. And what this passage is trying to teach us is that the spiritual babes are those who acknowledge that they can earn, that they cannot earn their salvation on their own. They are those who are dependent on God, are those who God has sovereignly revealed the gospel to. Now, if we begin, now we know who Christ is inviting and Christ is not. He's inviting the humble person who sees their sin and, in, and sees their desperate need of a Savior. Now, if we go to verse 28, after come to me, Christ says, all who are. All who are tells us that Christ is inviting a people who are humble, that have a present condition in them that exists already. Christ shows that these are people who he invites are heavy laden and are weary. Now, keep in mind is that this weariness and heavy burdens were created by the religious Pharisees and by their traditions and works causing the people to seek in vain a false gospel, a false way. So let's dive, in, let's dive deep into these words, weariness and heavy laden. The word weary is a present act of participle, which means it's an action that is continuous. This helps us to understand that the weary person is someone who's constantly seeking to know God and to want to know the way of salvation. Christ calls all who are exhausted from this vain search caused by the Pharisees of that day, the vain search of pleasing God according to man's standards. This is the person Jesus invites, the weary person who is wearied from his vain search for truth through human wisdom, who is exhausted from trying to earn salvation, and who has despaired of achieving God's standard of righteousness by his own efforts. The weary person refers to the internal weariness here, refers to the internal exhaustion caused by seeking divine truth through human wisdom. And next, the people who Christ invites, they're humble, they're weary, and another attribute Christ describes them as is they're heavy laden. And heavy laden translates as a perfect passive participle, which means it describes an action that has already happened to them in the very past showing that the weary people who Christ is inviting has had a great load dumped on them of works. The heavy laden suggests an external burdens caused by the futile efforts of works righteousness. And in Christ's day, the religious Pharisees claimed to be the interpreters of the law, but they misinterpreted the, every aspect of it. They're the ones who created the heavy burdens for the people with their self-righteousness, and their legalistic law keeping. And they tie up in Matthew 23, two, uh, verses 2 through 4, summarize this. It says, The scribes and Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, so do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do. For they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. Luke eleven forty six verse 46 says this, Woe to you lawyers also, for you load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. So the picture is quite clear. The genuine people of that day are trying to seek God, to seek salvation. And in that day, the, the ordinary people could not read. They relied on the religious teachers to teach them the Old Testament. But in fact, the Pharisees did not do that. They created a false teachings, false traditions, which created a greater burden on the person who is genuinely trying to seek God, to try to seek salvation. Christ here calls those who are weary and burdened by sin to salvation. He calls those who are self-centered, who are in a work-centered 
and he calls them to turn away from such practices and to come to him. The sinner that sees all his works righteousness trying to please God on his own is entirely meaningless. And the sinner is left in utter hopelessness. And hopelessness, I think we all can recall as part of salvation. It helps us to see that we need to look to someone else other than ourselves, and that is Christ. This passage also teaches that Christ has not called the person who's fine with their sin, but is burdened by it. The people who are sick of their sins, who desire to put away the evil of their sin, that is the one who Christ calls. The one who's humble, the one who's weary, the one who's burdened by their sin. The one who's trying to seek it in a human, uh, in a human wisdom, with human wisdom, with traditions. That's who Christ calls. So let us finish verse 28, and it says, And I will give you rest. Rest is a major theme in the Old Testament. Rest was associated with several things. The first thing I want to talk about, it was associated. It was associated with the presence of God. Exodus 33, 14 says, This is God speaking to Moses. My presence shall go with you, and I will give you rest. In the Old Testament, God's presence dwelt in the tabernacle. And later in the temple, when it was consecrated, uh, constructed by Solomon. Exodus 33, verse 14 tells us that God's presence was a sign of rest for this nation. Now, it's very interesting looking at the New Testament. John 1, 14 states that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word dwelt here is important because it literally means to tabernacle. John 1, 14 describes the incarnation as God coming to dwell on earth as a human. Christ is the presence of God. Colossians 2, 9 states this about Christ, for in him the fullness of deity, deity dwells in bodily form. This passage here is not only a salvific passage inviting sinners, but it's a clear attestation to Christ claiming deity. If we put it all together in the Old Testament, rest was associated with the presence of God. And John 1.14 shows that Christ is the presence of God. We only have rest in Christ because he is God. Another aspect of rest in the Old Testament was peace. Wherever there, there was rest for the nation, there was peace. Looking back at the Old Testament concept for Israel, peace meant for them with no war surrounding their borders, but this is not rest for us. We don't have peace with, with surrounding nations. The peace we have is through the Father, through the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, before we knew, before we were saved by God's grace, we were all in fact at war with God. And every unbeliever now is at war with God. Romans 8, 7, 8 says this, the mind is set, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. The unbeliever is at war with God. Romans 1.18 makes this clear, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Christ promises those who come to him in repentance and humble faith a spiritual rest. A rest that makes us at peace with the Father. To enter God's rest is to cease from all efforts of self-help in trying to earn salvation. And what this means for us believers is that to be in God's rest is to have the wonderful assurance that our eternal destiny is secure in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And when we enter this rest, we are given that assurance, as Philippians 1, 6 says, he who began a good work in us will perfect it until the day of Christ. So we come to, faith, we come to Christ by faith and humility. He gives us a rest from the terror of sin. Rest from the power of sin. A rest in God. A rest for the soul, a rest for the heart, and a rest flowing from the peace of God. 
and he gives us a peace. We have peace with God, but he also gives us a peace to our conscience. It no longer convicts us when we believe on him. Only the believer can have this rest. An unbeliever cannot. But this verse shows that there is hope for all sinners. Those who truly desire to put away their sin and to put it away. So all men are guilty of sin. The one whose conscience bears witness to his sin and sees he cannot earn salvation by his own weight. This is the one whom Christ is calling. The one who will humble himself and not look to anyone and not look within himself, but to Christ. This is the one who Christ calls. Only he can wipe away our sins. Resting in Christ reconciles us to the Father. So when coming into the rest of Christ, we're all called to serve him. And this is the second point this passage of Scripture is teaching us in verse 29. Passage of Scripture shows that rest in Christ calls for absolute obedience. We're called to be slaves to him. First off, verse 29 begins with, take my yoke upon you. What is a yoke? A yoke was an instrument made out of wood, placed around the necks of animals. It was used to harness and used to pull a cart, plow or mill, and beam, and was the means by which the animal's master kept it under control and guided it for useful work. Also, a yoke represented slavery. It represented human submission in the Old Testament. And I think it's quite clear that Christ is telling us that we must be servants to him, that we must be slaves to him. And this is his rest. All who rest in him, all who humbly put faith in him, he tells them, he tells us that we must obey him. And it's by obeying Christ, we take his yoke. We are called by Christ to be submissive learners. And it is when we truly submit to his lordship, is when we truly get to know him and learn from him. Now after this, Christ says, I am gentle and lowly in heart. I cannot think of a greater teacher to sit under, and I can't imagine being in that first century and being very weary and burdened by the teachings of the Pharisees. This His teaching, he says it himself, it's gentle, it's lowly. It's not like the Pharisees who didn't care, who showed no pity toward the people. He cares for us. He loves us. Christ shows compassion while we are ignorant. And because he's gentle and lowly, he gives us a rest, not weariness, only to those who submit to him and believe on him. And at the end of verse 29, Matthew quotes a verse from the Old Testament. It says, you shall find rest for your souls. Matthew quotes Jeremiah 6, 16, in which states this. Thus saith the Lord, stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not look at it. Looking at the context of Jeremiah 6, the prophet is speaking to Israel. He was speaking about the judgment to come upon the people because they disobeyed God's law. Jeremiah 6, 7 summarizes their evil in verse 10. Verse 7 says, As a well keeps its water fresh, so she keeps fresh her evil. Violence and destruction are heard within her. Sickness and wounds are ever before me. Jeremiah 6.10 summarizes what they did perfectly. The word of the Lord is to them an object of scorn. They take no pleasure in it. Judgment and destruction came upon the people of Israel because they were not obedient to the law of God. In the Mosaic Covenant, God promised Israel blessing if they would keep his law, and curse if they, did, if they went astray, which is summed up in Deuteronomy 11, verses 26 to 28, which states, See, I'm setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you listen to the commandments of the Lord your God, which I am commanding you today, and the curse, if you do not listen to the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the which way I'm commanding you today, by following other gods which you have not known. 
Israel keeping the law of God was so crucial to the plan because this was the only way that Israel would find rest. Israel was always promised the rest from God. In the history of Israel in the Bible, this rest was always seen as a physical rest. This rest is not just understood in the negative sense of no longer needing to wander, but also denotes a security from safety from one's enemies. Rest means freedom from enemy oppression and enjoyment of peace. But looking at this rest promise, it had to do with the land of Israel geographically. But now true rest is not located in a specific land, but in a person. It is bound up and given by Christ. The Jews, as we see in the New Testament, were awaiting their Messiah, who thought at his first coming, they were awaiting a powerful military leader that they were waiting that would give them this physical rest of the land. But Christ never promised this in his first advent, in his first coming. Our Christ promised in his first coming a, a rest for our soul, a rest from sin. A true rest for the soul comes from putting faith in him, the Lord Christ. Every soul that wants rest for itself it's the most desirable thing for it. And the only way to have this rest is to come to him. And if only true rest comes to him, it is clear that there is no other way to salvation. He is the only way. And lastly, the scripture also teaches in verse 30 that Christ is sufficient for this walk for us to be submissive to him. For it says, for my yoke is easy, my, my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The word easy can mean good, kind, serviceable, and wholesome. His yoke for us is a good thing. There's nothing that causes it harm to us. It's the opposite compared to the religious Pharisees of the day. It's refreshing. It's a yoke that's filled with love, just as all his commandments are. And because his yoke is easy, because his yoke is easy, Christ's yoke is easy, is also easy because he perfect, perfectly fulfilled all the commands of God that we could not. The wrath of God towards sin was poured out on Christ, the very wrath that we deserve. Christ takes this wrath from us, and instead, his righteousness is given to us. It's imputed to us, taking away our sins and our burdens. Christ does not promise us here an easy road. But we know that the road to heaven is on the narrow road to the narrow gate. This life is not easy at all. I think we can all agree that after following Christ, it's very difficult so honestly, the more burdens that we will, we will see. But he describes these afflictions and burdens as light. It's exactly how Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 4, 17. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. It's a beautiful passage of scripture and demonstrates God's ever everlasting love toward his saints, toward those whom he chosen before the foundation of the world. It's a, it's a passage of scripture that we must all come back to and remind ourselves that it's only in him we have rest. There is no other way. We cannot look to in ourselves. We cannot look to someone else, but it's in him, in him alone. Resting in Christ does not mean all our problems are solved. We will face still many trials here. But since we rest in him, none of these afflictions are compared to what waits for us in heaven. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we 
Thank you for giving us your son where we have peace with you and we enter into rest. True rest is only found, Heavenly Father, through your Son, through faith. And Lord, we see in this passage of Scripture that you call those who are weary and burdened by their sin. Oh Lord, I pray you would continue to convict us of our sin, to continue to help us repent of our sin and turn away from it, to make us more like Christ. Pray that you'd continue to transform us and renew us in every way to make us look, make us more to look like him. We thank you, Father, for this time. In Christ's name, amen.